folks can hear me okay? All right, perfect. Yes. All right. So, uh, again, my name is VK Gotti. I'm a clinician. I, take, I do take care of patients. I also am an academic physician, and I have a laboratory that's also focused more or less on breast cancer. And as Benet and I were just chatting, I wear a few other hats, including father of 13 and 8-year-old girls. So please forgive me. But I, yeah. <laughs> I do have some disclosures. There they are. Uh, I'm going to have a case-based presentation throughout. I think we have ARS questions associated with this talk as well, and hopefully they'll work fine. Uh, so this, these are all cases from my practice, and some as recently as seen in the last week. So this is an early, oh, and then I want to just highlight two themes before we get rolling. Um, I think from this ASCO, the, if I had to pick up one word that summarized the big innovations from this meeting, the word is de-escalation. And de-escalation is interesting because if you're de-escalating something, you're oftentimes doing what we call non-inferiority trials. So I'm going to present some results from some non-inferiority trials. And the other funny thing is I put these slides together when there was an international conference going on with a bunch of politicians, and there was a lot of interest in double negatives. And so you're going to hear some double negatives as well. That's the theme for this time. All right. So I have an early stage breast cancer, ER positive. She's a 47-year-old pre-menopausal woman grade two, invasive ductal, 1.5 centimeter. She's positive for her hormone receptors, negative for her two. Has a KI-67 rate of 15%. Uh, at surgery, she has N0 disease. So she's through her lumpectomy, she's planning radiation therapy, everything's set up. So here's what, here's my question to you. Do you order the 21 gene recurrence assay? Do you order the, oh, and I should point out, there are no wrong answers. There are also no right answers. It's, you know, it's a com conversation. Uh, order the 70 gene recurrence assay. Do you just give her adjuvant chemotherapy followed by OS plus an AI, ovarian suppression and aromatase inhibitor? Or do you just simply offer her to Monsipin? All right, let's see if this works. And I'm assuming we give it a couple minutes. Okay. It's as if I'm the only one who's answered this question. Ah, uh, there we go. So this is going to open up with our first de-escalation, our first non not inferior or inferior non inferiority trial, which is a Taylor X study. So if you'll recall, Taylor X was put together by the intergroup several years ago now, more than a decade ago. Lots of thousands of patients are enrolled, ten thousand plus, and the primary randomization arm was this intermediate score, which had been shifted. So previously. If you look at the company's websites, these numbers for the recurrence score cut points happen in different uh, places. But on this study, the powers that be kind of nudged these numbers down a little bit. So the recurrence scores that we were most interested in were the 11 to 25. So these are the patients with intermediate scores. And the question there would be, would there be a benefit for any chemotherapy in addition to endocrine therapy? As you guys are probably aware, Joe Sperano and colleagues published in the New England Journal a few years ago now that the, at the 10 but equal to 10 or lower group did exceptionally well with just endocrine therapy with fewer than 2% of patients recurring within a five year time span. What we didn't have was this intermediate group but also this high risk group. So this is from the New England Journal paper that came out the very same day and this is a probability of invasive disease free survival. And you can see that the lines overlap. The two lines for got chemotherapy and did not get chemotherapy are essentially indistinguishable from each other. And then the probability of freedom from metastases, so the previous was disease-free survival at any site, and this is the freedom from metastases was also essentially overlapping lines. Um, so this met the criteria, not surprisingly, of not inferior, right? So it is okay to de-escalate your care in terms of chemotherapy to these small, node-negative patients with uh, strong ERPR expression and otherwise favorable features. Uh, but based on the result of this assay. And then when you look at the nine-year results for all the arms, so the RMA was the one that we already had data for. That was the one with uh, ET and endocrine therapy alone, score zero to 10. And the nine-year data now show 3% disorder recurrence rate. That's pretty exceptional. 
B and C, the randomized group from this trial, sit at 5% of that time, same time frame as well. And all those three, I apologize for how this is projecting, but you can see that all of these lines really more or less overlap. And then you have the chemotherapy receiving group, the high risk group, probably the luminal B type breast cancers. And you'll see that even at uh, with good care, good chemotherapy and endocrine therapy, this is a group that's still with one in eight women suffering a recurrence at night. So other sort of exploratory analysis, this is what George Sledge, who's uh, now the Cancer Center Director at uh, Stanford would say is data torture. So if you torture the data long enough, it'll eventually tell you stuff. So the things that did not uh, get revealed were there were no interactions in terms of the recurrence scores, tumor size, grade, menopausal status, and clinical risk category, high versus low. And that clinical risk category is from a different study, which we're going to cover in just a minute. But there were some interesting interactions that did emerge, in particular with age and chemotherapy benefit, or age and menopause and chemotherapy benefit. So with some additional data torture, so these are what I call unplanned analyses, uh, or unpowered analyses, they did see some benefit for women with the intermediate scores when they were younger than 50. And the immediate question that the people on the podium asked right after this uh, speaker got down, but also many people in the audience asked, well, what did these young women get for endocrine therapy? Because we also know that when you add ovarian suppression to an AI, there's a lot of benefit there, especially for high-risk patients. And so it's hard to tease this out with this trial, but some of us are in the, of the feeling that maybe this is still not the group that benefits from chemotherapy, but that really benefits from, from improved endocrine therapy. Surprisingly enough, if you give chemotherapy to perimenopausal women and you put them in the menopause, they actually do better, right, with just that chemotherapy regardless of the type of tumor they have. So this may just be unmasking patients being put into menopause. It could just be that there was different usage rates of ovarian suppression plus endocrine therapy. We don't have that data. Hopefully we'll get that out so we can understand what really was the relationship for this group with respect to um, these recurrent scores. But the other trial that was also a not inferior trial is the uh, 70 gene recurrent score test, also known as the MAMA print, and this is the MindX study. So this study took a different approach. They took what they call the real world practical approach. So how does an oncologist view problem areas, and then how would they incorporate a test into those problem areas to help resolve who needs what types of therapies? And this is really, this slide is reminiscent of what our staging criteria look like, and they essentially created two groups, clinically high risk and clinically low risk. And so you can see this by CL, C low, and C high. So for example, the lady I just covered had a moderately differentiated cancer, grade two. She was <coughs> node negative under two centimeters. So she's a clinically low category, right? And they took these different groups of women and randomized them also to chemotherapy. And that's shown on this slide. And I apologize for how this is projecting. But essentially, they took the patients who had discordant results between the clinical risk and the MAMA print score. So MAMA print only does, does not report three categories. You just have high and low. And they asked the question, if we gave everybody with low, low scores just endocrine therapy, how did they do? If we gave the patients with high risk clinical scores and high MAMA prints, how did they do? And then there was a discordant groups in the middle. And they asked the question, what would happen to these patients depending on whether or not they got chemotherapy? And so these are what those lo results look like for that those discordant groups. And you'll see essentially lines that overlap again. So if you're clinically high risk and low genomic risk, there was did not seem to be chemotherapy benefit for surviving with that metastases, which was the primary endpoint for this study. And then low clinical risk, the opposite scenario, high genomic risk, similarly no chemotherapy benefit. If you look at disease-free survival, uh, there's this kind of almost in the data torture category, a small benefit noticed for giving chemotherapy versus no chemotherapy. But in terms of meaningfulness, it's a small number of women that may have benefited from that. And then similarly, the low risk, clinical risk, high genomic risk, no benefit. And then looking at overall survival, there were no differences in the groups, uh, depending on the discordance of this assay and whether or not they received chemotherapy. So when we think about that patient in the beginning, <coughs> it's okay to order a mammogram. It's okay to order an oncotype. If you get an oncotype and you have a low risk score, you feel comfortable with what this lady's getting. If you have an oncotype with an intermediate score, some people have planted some doubt in our minds about whether or not this is a woman that would benefit from chemotherapy. But interestingly, if you use the MindAct algorithm, she's clinically low risk. 
she does not not only benefit from chemotherapy, she doesn't benefit from the test, right? So in my, I'll just be honest, in my practice, this is a woman I actually am very comfortable saying to you, to her, you're good enough to be able to start tamoxifen. But you know, I think this is kind of the debate that's going to go in, in this particular field for a little bit until we get more clarity from some of these studies. So I'll keep moving then, a different type of patient. This is in the adjuvant HER2 setting. This is another young lady in my practice. Uh, actually, she's on treatment now. 33-year-old woman with a 0.8 centimeter ER negative, PR negative, HER2 three plus positive. So this is that HER2 enriched phenotype. No negative breast cancer. And she's status post mastectomy. How many of you offer her no adjuvant therapy? How many offer her weekly paclitaxel plus trastuzumab for 12 months? How many give her B but stop the trastuzumab early? Uh, how many give her TDM1 for a year? How many give her ACTH with H for six months? see the number of respondents no, <laughs> and sometimes they have music would you like it if I say <laughs> So the reason why I bring this up is one of the other de-escalation trials that was presented that I think actually can have meaningful impact is the Persephone trial. And this is a randomized phase three trial, and there have been others done that have tried to ask the same question of six months versus 12 months. Um, and, but this one was big, and actually I think answered the 